Oh, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to sing, sing, sing for you. Gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to sing, sing, sing for you. Gonna sing, sing, sing for you. I say we're going to work and pray oh, yeah. and sing every day for you. We're going to work and pray oh, yeah. and sing every day for oh, you. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Live, for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going
together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up, I don't feel no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where I held.
Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are so glad that you did. Let's go to God in a word of prayer before we start the sermon. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you and we worship you. Father, we know that in all things, your power rules and reigns. And though we live in a world where there is so much chaos, there is a lot of destruction and just a lot of distractions, we know ultimately you win. Ultimately, your will will be done. And we pray, Father, for those who have perished recently in Afghanistan. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan that you will protect and guide them. We pray, Father, for the situations going on in Haiti and really around the world. Father, we need you. And we pray that you are with us in a very powerful way. God, we ask that as your people, we will let your light shine through us in this dark world. Father, people are hurting with COVID and with other things that are going on. But in all things, help us to live lives that glorify you. Be with us this morning as we study your word and help us to truly follow you with our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our strength, and to love you with everything that we have. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome to our service this morning, and we are continuing our journey through the book of Matthew. But I want to just recap, we finished the Sermon on the Mount, and I just wanted to recap some things that we learned from the Sermon on the Mount. And basically, Jesus calls his disciples to be different and to live more righteous than the religious people around them by truly obeying the meaning of the law from the heart, not just doing the letter of the law on the outside. He calls them to change their audience and change the way they view the world so that they can serve God, seek his kingdom, and not worry by trusting in God and in his word. He calls his followers to act in love with all those around them, including their enemies, by living out due to others what you would have them do to you. He calls his disciples to build their lives on his teaching that will lead them along a narrow way that results in a life that displays fruit stemming from the lordship of Jesus, all to the glory of God the Father. See, there are a lot of different aspects to our lives, but ultimately they all need to line up under the obedience and teachings of Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we exit the Sermon on the Mount that we can be determined to be what God calls us to be. Because ultimately what we are on the inside will come out on the outside. And that's how God wants us to live our lives. That's how Jesus wants us to live our lives, from the inside out. And I pray that the Sermon on the Mount has been a blessing to you and a challenge to you as much as it has been for me. And now we get to chapter 8 and chapter 9. We're going to take them together, but we're going to do it in a little bit different fashion than, we, than what we've been doing. We've been doing it basically almost like a verse by verse or section by section. And this time, we're going to take different sections of chapter 8 and 9, and we're going to examine them. Because we're going to be studying out the, and, and, and remembering the cost of discipleship. Jesus does, well, before I do that, let me ask you this. How many of you remember MTV? when it used to play music videos. I was alive, and during that time, everybody says, I want my MTV. I think I was in probably elementary school or maybe middle school, and people wanted their MTV because they, all they did was play music videos. And I was thinking about MTV today. You don't see anything musically, really, on MTV anymore. And it made me wonder, it's like, why, why, why does music television not play music? And basically the answer is that the demands were too high for the licensing fees. And, and MTV didn't want to pay them. And so they moved away from music videos and they went more to um, 
less expensive and more profitable reality TV programming. And many of you, if you've ever watched MTV Now, pretty much it's ridiculousness. And, and you, you begin to see MTV music television isn't about music, it's about other things because the cost was too high. Now, if Peter and the 12 disciples were alive, they would ask this question. Do you remember when church was all about discipleship and following Jesus? Do you remember when everywhere we turned, all we saw were disciples following Jesus. But today, when we look at church, we see programs, we see ministries, we see a lot of things, but we don't see as much discipleship following Jesus. And we ask the question, why? Because people aren't willing to pay the high price of discipleship. That would be a sad commentary for any church that is supposed to be about making disciples of Jesus that make disciples of Jesus, not being about making disciples of Jesus, but being about other things that cost less than the cost of discipleship. And so this morning, I want to call us to remember the cost of true discipleship to Jesus. Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living. Robert Fulgham said, an examined life is no picnic. You know, when Socrates talked about an unexamined life, as Christians, as disciples of Jesus, sometimes we can fall into habit and routine and really stop taking assessment about the quality of our fellowship to Jesus, our discipleship to Jesus. And as the second quote says, when we start examining, we realize, hey, there's, there might be some things that we need to get back on track on. It's not a picnic. And so this morning, as we go through the scriptures, I want us to assess. And with every assessment, it should always lead to action. And so Sit back, buckle up, because we're going to learn about or relearn and remember the cost of discipleship. So we're going to go through eight and nine. Now, understand something very important. Chapter eight and chapter nine contain, contains 10 different miracles that Jesus performed. And in between about every three, Jesus does some teaching about discipleship. We're going to cover the miracles later. Right now, we're going to focus on the teachings between the miracles. And I believe Jesus taught between the miracles because he he had the disciples' attention. When you see someone healed of, of demon possession, God gets your attention. And so we pick it up in chapter 8 in verse 1. It says, when Jesus came down from the mountainside... Large crowds followed him. That's verse 1. So Jesus came down from the mountain. And what this means is, just like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the law, he gave the law on the mountain, and now he came down the mountain, and the expectation was to do the law. Well, Jesus just got through with the Sermon on the Mount on top of the mountain. So coming down the mountain, what should we see Jesus doing? doing what he just preached about. Literally living the Sermon on the Mount. But as I said, he did 10 different miracles in the midst of chapter 8 and chapter 9. So number one, he heals a man with leprosy. He heals a centurion's servant. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He calms a storm. He heals and delivers the demon-possessed men. He heals and forgives the paralytic. He heals the bleeding woman. He raises the ruler's daughter from the dead. He heals two blind men. And then he heals a mute man. So he does these ten miracles that really blew people away because he was basically fulfilling 
the Sermon on the Mount in the midst of all these miracles and in performing these miracles. And so we see how Jesus deals with the, the crowd, so to speak, the people, some insiders, some outsiders, but mainly they were people that society probably had given up on. The two demoniacs were in Gentile territory where, the, where Jews would not go. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So we're going to focus on what Jesus taught in between the miracles. What happened between the miracles? Jesus taught his disciples about what it truly meant to follow him. Why? Because he had their attention. Why? Because at every healing, at every miracle, I believe his disciples were even more and more entrenched and more and more convinced that this is the Messiah and we need to follow him. But what we will see is Jesus didn't lessen the cost to follow him. He laid out the true cost of what it would mean to be a disciple of Jesus. So after the first three miracles, we're going to pick it up in verse 18. It says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Now, I want us to see something. Jesus gave orders to go to the other side of the lake. Well, what was on the other side of the lake? The Gentile, the Decapolis, the Gentile territory, a place any good Jew would never go. That's why it says Jesus gave orders. He didn't ask them. He gave orders, which might imply he got some pushback from his disciples. Like, Jesus, are you sure you want to go to the other side? You know what's on the other side. There are only Gentiles on the other side. Well, what did Jesus preach in the Sermon on the Mount? Love your enemies. What did he say? Do to others as you would have them do to you. Jesus has everything good, and he didn't want to just keep it contained within the Jewish area, he, went, he wanted to go to the Gentile area to show light there too. In verse 19, then a teacher of the law or a scribe came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. So imagine this guy in the crowd seeing this interaction between Jesus and his disciples and Jesus having to give the order, hey, we are going to the other side. And then this guy pops out of the crowd and says, hey, Jesus, hey, teacher, I'll go wherever you want to go. Unlike your disciples who are giving you a hard time, I, teacher, will go wherever you go. Now notice, he calls him teacher or rabbi, not Lord. And notice, Jesus didn't call him like he called the other disciples. This guy is choosing Jesus to follow. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So here Jesus gets with this guy, or this guy gets with Jesus, and he says, hey, I'll follow you to the other side. And Jesus says, oh, wait a minute, to follow me isn't just to the other side. It's not just a one-time campaign. It's not just a one-time religious experience. It's a lifetime commitment to possibly being uncomfortable. We'll talk more a little bit about that. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus is talking to what is described as one of his disciples, maybe not one of the 12, but someone who definitely made a decision to follow him, and he calls him Lord. He says, Lord, let me first go bury my father. See, he understood Jesus is going to go. Jesus is going to travel. He heard the cost of the, the den and, and the, the, the cost of not having a place to lay his head. And he says, hey, I'll do it. But first, let me go bury my father. Now, there's about three different scenarios that this could mean. It could mean his father might have recently passed away and he needed to literally bury his father. Or it could mean that his dad is alive and he was the oldest and he had um, the responsibility of making sure his dad gets a proper burial. So 
it's, he needed to put seeking the kingdom first, so to speak, on an indefinite hold until he fulfills the duty that he has to his family. Or the third possibility is his dad has already passed, and according to Jewish tradition, you would lay that body or that person in the tomb, you'd, you'd put spices on them, wrap them up, and then after a year, you would take the remains and put it in an ossuary, and then you would put it in the wall or bury it or do something, and, and that's how many people would be buried in one tomb. And usually it was after a year the family would then come in and, and take the remains and, and bury them. And maybe that, I, I like that thought, that maybe the guy was in the midst of the year of his dad dying and then needing to be buried. And he told Jesus, hey, I just, I just have two more months, or I just have a month, or maybe I have nine months, whatever. But I have some time that I'm responsible for to make sure my father gets a proper burial. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus did not succumb to cultural norms, but instead called him to seek the kingdom first. Called him to come follow. Because why? You don't owe it to the dead you should be committed to the one who gives life, Jesus Christ. And so we see that there's two things when it comes to the cost of discipleship. Being a disciple of Jesus, it costs us comfort. Being a disciple of Jesus, it costs us convenience. It's not comfortable being a disciple of Jesus because we are called to live in ways that the rest of the world doesn't. We are called to give up things the rest of the world doesn't. We are called to live, in fact, counterculturally, where it's not convenient to follow Jesus in a culture that predominantly serves money. In a culture that predominantly serves stuff. And here Jesus is saying to the first scribe, hey, you've got to be willing to pay the price of being uncomfortable. Spending nights outside. See, Jesus says, following me is literally following me. It's not two hours here or three hours there or just on Sunday. You follow me. Their thought of discipleship way, way outdoes our thought of discipleship. Because Jesus, when he called people to him, he called them to be with him. That means spending gobs and gobs of time, all their time with Jesus. And so where Jesus went, that's where his disciples went. And it was not easy. And it was not convenient. Because the priority was always the kingdom in God's righteousness. Why? Because that's what Jesus preached on the Sermon of the Mount. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Why can Jesus not have a place to lay his head? Because he trusts that God will make sure he has, a, he has clothes, make sure he has food, make sure he has drink. Why? Because he doesn't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough trouble on its own. We literally see Jesus living the Sermon on the Mount and calling people who would want to follow him to do the same. You see, that second guy might say, but Jesus, I love my family. Later on in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says anyone who loves their family more than him isn't worthy of him. Can't be his disciple. See, we live in a time where mothers worship their children. Fathers worship their job. People worship each other. When we should be committed to following Jesus. Yes, even putting Jesus above our family. Now you might say, Jesus would never call us to neglect our family. That's not what I'm saying. But, but what Jesus says, we can't love them more than we love him. And if it came down to choosing between our family and Jesus, we better choose Jesus. Because I believe by choosing Jesus, we can better love our family. But without putting Jesus first, we make our family, our spouse, our children idols. And we put them in a position they should never be in. So to be a disciple of Jesus, it costs our comfort. It costs our convenience. 
Going on to chapter 9, he performed some other miracles. It says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me. So here, these other guys were following Jesus, but Jesus calls Matthew at his tax collector's booth. Now, he was probably collecting taxes for Herod Antipas and, and, and usually probably like a customs, customs tax for trades and things like that and goods. And he finds him and he says, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. So Matthew probably wasn't alone in this tax collecting booth. He probably had co-workers. But Matthew was a Jew who worked for the Roman government who were the oppressors of his very own people. Matthew became an extension of Rome, an extension of the oppression, an extension of the corruption, an extension of the sin that people saw Rome being. And so Matthew was like a doubly bad person because not only did he betray his people, but he was working for the enemy to oppress his own people. And Jesus says, come follow me. Now you can imagine what the Pharisees were thinking about Jesus calling a tax collector to be one of his disciples. How can you call this outsider, this guy who is despised, to be one of your disciples? The Pharisees would ask. All he's going to do is make you dirty. All he's going to do is bring like a bad reputation to your group. Because he's such a traitor. He's such a sinner. Verse 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. So Jesus not only called him but said, hey, we're going to go eat at your house. So I'm sure Matthew was fired up that the Messiah called him. Someone who probably has experienced hatred by his own people, being an outcast from his own people. And here you have the Messiah saying, come, be with me. So they go to his house, many tax collectors, probably all of Matthew's oikos. Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples. They didn't confront Jesus, but they confronted his disciples, maybe because they were on the fringes and Jesus was in the midst of maybe telling a story to the sinners and tax collectors. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, so this somehow got to Jesus. Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus had a mission to bring the outsiders in. Into what? Into his kingdom. Because see, if it was up to the Pharisees, who believed that the only time the Messiah would come was if everything was perfect, if everything was righteous, if everything was pure. Then the Messiah would come. That thinking would prevent them from dealing with anybody who is messy, anyone who is sinful, anyone who could ruin their plan of complete righteousness and purity. And here you have Jesus showing up not only calling the impure and the sinner, but eating and drinking with the sinners and tax collectors, having a meal with them. In the first century, to have a meal with someone meant that you were in good relationship with them, good standing with them. So the Pharisees were thinking to themselves, is Jesus approving of their sinfulness? Is Jesus approving of their lifestyle? Well, Jesus says he didn't call, come to call the righteous, but sinners. These guys knew they were sinners. They knew they needed saving from sin. See, Jesus didn't hang out with them and join them in their sin. Jesus joined them and called them from their sin. He called them to save them from their sin. And this is huge. Why? Because the righteous, they don't think they need saving. Because they can't see their sin. Remember the plank? And the speck, you have people with planks looking at the people 
with specks, seeing all their sin instead of seeing their need. But the whole time, they neglect to see their need for salvation. Remember, Sermon on the Mount. We see Jesus living it out. He, they had no clue why Jesus would hang out with sinners. Well, what's the purpose of the Messiah? To seek and save the law. To save people from their sin. The Pharisees are busy trying to eradicate sin by living according to the law, by living by all these rules and regulations. They're trying to eliminate sin when it takes the Messiah to remove sin. And that's why they couldn't understand why would Jesus hang out with sinners. Jesus says, he quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. He says, well, Hosea 6.6 6, says, Come, verse 1, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. See, when they heard the partial quote of Hosea 6, it would come to mind all of Hosea. And it was a passage about coming back to God. And Jesus says, hey, go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In this mercy, this word mercy is, is it's compassion. So here we have the call of, or, or, or it's, it's compassion, it's, it's, it's love. I don't want to jump off of that too quickly because sometimes we forget, hey, Jesus is about love. And what did Jesus say? Do to others as you would have them do to you. Love your enemies. See, the Pharisees had the perfect opportunity to put in practice a Sermon on the Mount. They didn't do it, but Jesus did. Why? As a rabbi, he gave the law or gave the way of life, and now he's living that way of life. And his disciples are following him. So what are the two things that Jesus is, is teaching his disciples? Number one, being a disciple of Jesus requires change. See, they had to change the way they saw sinners. Not as a threat to their way of life, but as an opportunity to put into practice what their religion called them to do, and that is love. He says, we got to change. We got to change the way the religious people interact with the sinning people. We've got to not join them in their sin, but we've got to reach out to them. We've got to love them and take the gospel to them. It's not enough to sit in walled buildings and be a holy huddle. We've got to change and go out and and really talk to those who don't know Christ. And being a disciple of Jesus requires clemency, mercy. See, more than ritual, God wants us to love and to have mercy. How merciful are we? How, how when we, we see the same sect attracted, when we see those strung out on drugs, those who are immoral, those who are just engaging in all sorts of things that we would never be caught dead doing. Is there mercy or simply judgment? Is, is there mercy or is there condemnation? Is there love or is there apathy? See, the cost of following Jesus means we've got to change and we've got to be merciful goes on in verse 14. Then John's disciples came and asked, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. 
No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour out the new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. See, this, this teaching of Jesus requires new vessels, new containers. That's why when we become disciples of Jesus, when we are baptized into Christ, we become new creations, as Romans chapter 6 talks about, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about. We are new creations. Why? Because it takes new containers to hold this new teaching of Jesus. See, we hear for the first time in a while John's disciples. John is in prison, but they're still following John. Who did John tell them they should follow? Not him after they should follow the one that came after him, which is Jesus. Yet they were still hanging on to John. And they had this strict fasting lifestyle. Same thing with the Pharisees. So you had this kind of lifestyle that was uh, almost depressing. And then you had Jesus' disciples, man, just, just having a ball because Jesus is there. It lets us know they did not see Jesus as the Messiah. They might have seen him as a rabbi. They didn't see him as the Messiah because they were not celebrating and rejoicing like Jesus' disciples. What about us? When people see our lives, when they see us, do they see the light of life in our lives? Or do they see a bunch of beat down people, beat down by life, beat down by circumstance, instead of understanding that we serve the God of heaven and earth, who created heaven and earth, the God who created the universe, his spirit resides in us. You see, we are called to be new containers for this new teaching. And the thing about these new containers, when they get new wine in them, is that they get stretched. Boy, we need to get stretched in our faith again. Some of us have become rigid. Some of us have become stiff. Some of us have become brittle. And these teachings that we're learning about, in Je about Jesus, we're not, they're not challenging us anymore. Why? Because we can't be stretched. They're not moving us or inspiring us anymore. Why? Because we've become brittle and set in our ways. You know, I was speaking to one brother who's in his 70s, and, and we were having a conversation. And he knows a lot. He's been through a lot. He's experienced a lot. And he was feeling kind of down. And then I told him, I said, how come you don't do something to pass your knowledge on to the next generation. And a light went off. And all of a sudden, this guy that I was sitting with that was kind of down, all of a sudden a new fire was lit inside of him. Why? Because he found uh, another purpose. He found this purpose. Jesus has walked with him, and he's walked with Jesus, and Jesus has filled them full of all this stuff, and now he can pass it on to other people. Isn't that what discipleship is? How many of us, we need a light, we need, we need something to, to, to pour into, someone to pour into, and it's up to us to rely on God in order to find that person. Some of us, the reason why we become set in our ways, the reason why we become a little depressed is because we're not about our purpose. We're not being stretched. We're not allowing ourselves to be stretched. We're not taking this new wine and pouring it into other containers. And we need to be. How do we do that? Study the Bible with people. Share our faith. Take on other disciples to walk with us. And we walk with them and we teach them how to obey Jesus. I guarantee you, you if you are pouring yourself into someone, there is a fire in you that is, that is not present with someone that is sitting there with all this knowledge and not doing anything with it. New teachings take new containers. And we need to give what's in these containers to others. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, after some more miracles, Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching 
in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send that workers into his harvest field. Again, being a disciple of Jesus leads to compassion. But being a disciple of Jesus also demands commitment. Here you have Jesus seeing the crowd and over and over again, you have Matthew talking about the crowd versus the disciples, the disciples versus the crowd. You have Jesus' disciples around him and Jesus looking out into the crowd and he doesn't see a bunch of sinners that are just doomed to go to hell. He sees a bunch of people that need a shepherd and he has compassion on them. And that word compassion means that he was moved to his very core. His heart went out to them. He had compassion on what he saw in the crowds. And the same word is used later when he feeds the 5,000, when he says he has compassion for these people. But Jesus' compassion didn't stop there. It always leads to action. In chapter 10, what does he do? He sends the, the 12 out. To minister to the crowds. Why? Because Jesus made a second observation. He, didn't, he not only said these are like sheep without a shepherd. He, and, and, and before I move on to the next observation. Sheep without a shepherd rings of Ezekiel chapter 34. And I want you to read verses 1 through 6. In that God sees his people being treated poorly by the leaders who were their shepherds. And G, God says I will go seek my sheep. I will be their shepherd. And we see Jesus doing exactly that. The crowd, sheep without a shepherd, and Jesus wanting to be that shepherd. He's healing. He's teaching. He's proclaiming. There's three things that he does in his ministry. He teaches the word. He proclaims the kingdom. And he meets physical needs. So when we have compassion, we know we have the right com kind of compassion when it leads to action. If we simply just feel sorry for people but don't do anything, that's not the compassion Jesus had. The compassion Jesus had was when he saw it, he did something. It moved him to do something about their situation. But he makes another observation. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Think about it. Who's doing all the healing? Who's doing all the seeking? Who's doing all the binding up? Who's doing all the delivering? It's just Jesus. And he's looking out in the crowd. He says, man, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He could have said, the workers is one. And we see in, verse, in chapter 10 where he sends them out. He says, pray, for that the Lord of the pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. And this, the disciples begin to pray. And guess who he sends out? He sends them out. When's the last time you prayed for God to send out the workers and then you went out and worked? That's what, it, that's what happened in the scriptures. But it takes commitment. It takes diligence. It takes a willingness to put the kingdom before anything and everything else. You see, we can't work in the harvest field if we're not available, if we have no time, or if we're just too busy. Or we compartmentalize our life and don't see our work as an act of worship. We don't see opportunities to share our faith, to reach out to people, to love people. Anywhere and everywhere we go, there's a harvest field. But do we see it as that? And do we take advantage of that? Are we committed to that? Are we even cognizant of that? So Jesus says, hey, pray. And I'm sure they did. And the next thing you know, they're out in the harvest. They're out working that harvest field. Disciples of Jesus, get ready to work. Fields are ripe. People are looking for something real in this world full of craziness. Everybody is divided, and they're looking for unity. Everybody is hating each other, and they're looking for love. If they don't find it in the disciples where are, of Jesus, where are they going to find it? Remembering the cost of discipleship. This is just a small snapshot 
of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. It costs comfort. It costs convenience. It's, it's, it requires change. It requires clemency, mercy. It needs a new container. It leads to compassion. It demands commitment. See, we don't want to be like MTV, where we were established and known for one thing, but because the cost was so high, we decided to change our programming. The church started as a movement of disciples in Jesus as their Lord. We've got to keep that programming going at all costs. And it costs a lot. But my question is, are you still willing to pay that price? Or have you changed the programming in your life? See, like I said, it's a snapshot. That should be your picture in that frame. But if someone was to look at your life, would they see? Would they see someone paying the price? Would they see someone who is committed? Would they see a new creation? Would they see someone that's uncomfortable, that's committed, that's changed, that's merciful? Would they see it? Are you willing to pay the price to deny yourself? to die to self, to take up your cross, to follow Jesus. You might have made that commitment some years ago, but are you ready to make that commitment today? Church, let us not be a church that is about other things other than following Jesus. Let us be a people who are saved, that have not wasted their lives. But let us be a group of people who are saved for a purpose. To follow Jesus into that harvest field, seeking and saving the lost and helping people know that there is a Messiah, that there is an escape from this world. And his name is Jesus. Are you willing to pay the price? You decide. God bless and have a great week. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. 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 And He, and he will, lift will lift you up. And He, and he will, lift will lift you up. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 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 That saved a wretch, a wretch like me. That saved, that saved a, wretch a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. 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 Was blind, was blind but, now but now I see. Was blind, was blind but, now but now I see. When we've been there ten thousand years. When we've been there ten thousand years.
Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. And he and he Let's take a short time to remember Jesus, the Lord and Savior for the world. My name is Wayne Kishbaugh. My wife Donna and I live here in Henderson, Nevada. Remembering a man of humble birth. Remembering a man who loved God more than he loved his parents. Remembering a man who is tempted by evil, yet he never sinned. Remembering a man who would wake up early to have alone time with his heavenly father. Remembering a man who chose to forgive instead of giving revenge. Remembering a man who healed the sick. Remembering a man who even touched people with diseases when that was unheard of back then and forbidden. Remembering a man who ate with tax collectors and people who were called sinners remembering a man whose last words on earth were in a prayer in John chapter 13, a prayer for unity, that they may be one as I am in you and you are in me. God talking to, Jesus talking to God. Remembering a man who was humble enough to listen to people's needs, he helped the poor and he helped the needy. Remembering a man who spoke with authority and has earned our respect. Remembering a man who was betrayed, imprisoned, and punished to death for our sins and crimes which he did not commit. A man who was innocent, yet convicted. Remembering a man who still lives today in heaven and in our hearts and minds. Remembering the Prince of Peace, and we need a lot of peace, Remembering the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Remembering a man who died for our sins. He paid the price for our selfishness. He was bleeding for our greed. He was broken for our sinful pride and arrogance. Let's take time to pray right now and remember Jesus, the Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, we lower our heads to remember your son Jesus. His example was perfect. It was amazing. He proved your love to us and his love to us. We recognize that he walked the earth so long ago and yet he still impacts us, impacts the world. We remember how he was punished for our sins. We remember that you have provided a way for us to have forgiveness, how Jesus was the unblemished lamb that was sacrificed for our sins, how he was the perfect sacrifice. And now we have the opportunity to be with you in heaven by faith, as long as we stand firm until the end. And as long as we're in a right relationship with us, please uh, guide us and lead us. Thank you so much for Jesus. I remember Jesus' blood being shed for our sins, which represents the juice or the wine that some of us are, are drinking, the, the bread that we're about to, those who have, are about to take, some of us, that it represents Jesus' body, which was broken for our sins. Please forgive us of our sins. We need you. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining us. We are so glad that you did. If you want more information about Valley Christian, please go to valleychristians.org. That's valleychristians with an S dot org. There you can find more information about us. You can sign up for Bible studies. You can get more information about small groups around the valley if you would like. And you're also able to give online if you would like to do that as well. Again, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. Let's journey together. God bless and we'll see you next time.